Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Observatory. Uh, today, we're going to be chatting with Ben Stansel. Ben, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Uh, so many of you may have heard of or seen Ben before. Uh, so Ben co-founded an analytics company called Mode. He's also been pretty popular on uh, Substack and just a general voice in the modern data stack conversation recently over the last uh, year or so, especially. Um, so Ben, maybe we can get started with just what is Mode? How did you decide to co-found that? How did how did you sort of get started there? Yeah. Um, so Mode is a it's a basically a BI tool for analysts. So we we. Originally, Mode came from uh, an internal product that we used at the company I was at before before founding Mode. So me and the other two folks that I started it with were on the data team at a company called Yammer. Uh, Yammer was a like, social network for companies. It was Facebook for work before Facebook for work existed. We built an internal data product basically to, to help the data team that I was on and my other two co-founders were on to, to distribute our analysis around the organization. Um, Essentially, we were providing kind of like BI-like services to the organization, but in kind of a more modern way, um, where we'd get a bunch of ad hoc questions, people trying to figure out you know, which products do we build, who do we market to. We'd write a bunch of SQL queries, build a bunch of charts, ship them off to people, uh, and then they'd want to update them and look at dashboards, that kind of stuff. At the time, we didn't have any tools that that could solve that problem. Uh, this was in the world of, of kind of like legacy BI, which was too constraining for what we wanted to do. Uh, Tableau was there, not quite to the degree that it is today, but also we wanted something that was more code sort of first and, and SQL was a native part of the experience. Uh, and that didn't exist. Um, and so our one of our co-founders, one of the technical co-founder, um, actually was leading the data engineering team at Yammer and built a couple internal tools to help us do that. And one of them was effectively a SQL like editor in a in a browser uh, with charts attached to it. Um, after, so Yammer ended up getting acquired by Microsoft in 2012. After that acquisition, we talked to a bunch of other people around Silicon Valley and realized that a lot of people either were building that same product. So Facebook had a version and Airbnb had a version and Pinterest had a version and Spotify had a version. And all these tech companies were building these same kind of like data tools for their data teams. Um, or the companies we talked to were like, this thing is great, can we buy it? Uh, and so once we saw that, we're like, hey, maybe there's something to this. Um, I mean, there's like this is actually a trend that's changing the way that people think about data. It's not just sort of traditional BI, but like these kind of analytics team focused BI. Uh, and so we decided to say, hey, let's go out and, and try to build that product. And that's basically what Mode has been ever since. And uh, it, I mean, you mentioned like building it around SQL, building it around data as code. I feel like those have been sort of evergreen principles that are still very popular concepts in in the tools that we're seeing. You know, just kind of rising in popularity now, even. That wasn't necessarily the case in, say, 2013. Um, so, so Modo started in 2013, which now is, seems like quite a long time ago. When we talked to people, there were some people who, who very much like got it, that wanted a tool that was, that was a SQL experience, that wanted a way to, to enable people to write code, um, that weren't looking for kind of the drag and drop, choose a bunch of things from drop downs kind of experience. Um, initially, that was kind of a hard sell. Honestly, like there were there were teams that really liked that perspective, but there were a lot of folks who were coming out of again traditional BI tools. They use things like Click or they use things like Business Objects, and were realizing those tools were breaking down. But the way they imagined it was just a more flexible drag and drop tool. It was like I want something where it looks the same as Google Analytics, but I can do more stuff in it. And and there was kind of a mentality shift instead of thinking like just give me a drag and drop tool with more features. It's like actually the right way to do this is just learn a bit of SQL and do this in code. In 2017, it started to become oh wait maybe SQL is actually the better way of doing this. We have data teams that are that are sort of more code forward. I think that that transition is sort of fully complete in in a lot of ways now, um, where data teams are very much SQL focused and comfortable in that. There still is very much a need for the the kind of accessible interfaces for people who don't want to write SQL and things like that. But but a tool that has SQL front and center is no longer kind of alien to a lot of people. That's that's now what they're kind of seeing is, oh, this is the right way of doing things. This is the language that we should be using. I, I was at Uber for, for quite a while there in, in data there, mm -hmm. and that was absolutely what, what we saw as well. There was a SQL training class and a lot of people who came through Uber learned SQL on the way in the door. And um, I, I think that that's increasingly like a common thing, right? Is, is SQL as that lingua franca. Uber had a tool, and they still do, I guess you would know this better than I would, uh, the data query builder, I think it was called. Um, so a query builder was built by an engineer 
who left Yammer shortly after the acquisition to go to Uber that was inspired by the same internal tool that inspired Moat. So it was like, the, the tool we had at Yammer was literally called Query Builder. And he just like picked it up and stuck it into Uber. Uh, and then they know, took it a bunch of different directions and added a whole bunch of things onto it. And, and obviously you know, things like Big Eye are, are inspired from a lot of that infrastructure. Um, but yeah, the first data tool that Uber ever had was was more or less identical to the data tool that Yammer had, which was more or less identical to the inspiration for Mode. Uh, yep, I, I know the person you're talking about and um, a shout out to them if they're watching. But yeah, Query Builder, a lot of mileage out of Query Builder. So definitely something there. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to another question, um, and I'll pause uh, as I was asked to do. Um, so, Ben, you've been working in analytics since at least 2012 or so, um, and that mm-hmm. predates, I mean, I, this seems crazy, but that, that does predate a lot of like sort of the major evolutions in the data landscape. Um, Snowflake, Airflow, DBT uh, all came on or, or later than, than that time. Um, so from your perspective, you know, you mentioned uh, sort of lineage or some some inside baseball in, in the evolution of data. Um, how do you feel like data's uh, evolved since then and more specifically sort of this analytics uh, end of things? Do you feel like it's, is it getting better? Is it moving in the right direction? What's your, what's your overall perspective on it? In some ways, for sure, but in other ways, kind of not. Um, there's, so, so prior to, to being in tech at all, I worked in DC doing a bunch of econ research for a while. Um, so sort of my background is, is econ. And one of these sort of like mysteries of econ is, is basically like, where did the productivity of the information age go? Um, that we have a bunch of computers and in theory, they should be making us way more productive, but like in productivity statistics that show up in sort of those, you know, the way people measure GDP and things like that, you don't see it. Like people aren't actually way more productive, despite the fact that they should be given all the, all the new technology that we have over the last 30 years. Data teams feel a little bit similar to me, where we have a lot better tools. One of the things we want to try to do is we wanted to build like dashboards of Salesforce data. We hired a full-time engineer to maintain pipelines between Salesforce and a vertical warehouse. We have basically a full-time DBA to maintain a vertical warehouse that we had to pay for the hardware to run. We built internal tools to build those dashboards. It was orders of millions of dollars a year to be able to put those dashboards together that now you could do with probably things that are mostly free. Um, you know, you pay a thousand dollars a month for a small snowflake instance. Uh, you use some like the lower tiers of five trend and DVT and tools like mode. And you can get that for, for basically nothing. So in that sense, like, it's way better. like the life of an analyst is, is way better than it used to be. The thing is like, are analysts doing more interesting things? Like every every data person sort of is like, I don't want to build dashboards. I don't want to build pipelines. I want to solve the interesting strategic problems. And like, are we solving those problems? It's like, kind of still just building dashboards. We've made the, the cost of producing dashboards and data pipelines and putting data in places so cheap that we've increased the demand of what we want to do with it so much that we haven't actually gotten out of the trap of just kind of building the the first floor of what like a data library of tools would look like. Like it used to be that support teams would not come to you and ask for dashboards of support stuff because they know that you're just trying to build dashboards that show how you spend your millions of dollars of marketing every month. And like the support dashboard is way down the list on that. Now it's like, that's really easy too. And so you get all this more demand for these sorts of things and so I think analysts are still kind of chasing a lot of other things to build before they get to these like strategic questions that are the things that are supposedly motivating all of us to get in this career in the first place. So to me, that is less of a problem of tooling now and more of a problem of analysts have to basically say no. Because we can doesn't mean we should. That, that our job is still to answer these big, important questions. So we obviously had to prioritize the big ones because we can only answer three a year. And now it's like, we can answer a thousand a year. We should still be answering the thousand most important ones, not the thousand that come across our desk first because they all take a third of a day. Um, so I think there's like some cultural stuff to change around how we actually operate in a way where it's so cheap to, to produce stuff. Um, and I'm not quite sure we've, we've really figured that out yet. The supply goes up and so does the demand, right? There's this equilibrium point that stays right where it is. Um, so 
maybe that's a great segue into into another question that I have. In the last year or so, you've gotten a lot more vocal um, than I think maybe you were previously. Maybe that just comes from being a founder at a, a you know a growing company it keeps you keeps you pretty busy, I'm sure. But um, you started a Substack about data that's got some readership. Um, you've been doing more speaking events. Is there something specific that motivated you to start taking a bit more of a public role in sort of this? There's a lot of conversation right now about exactly what you just talked about, process on data teams, the philosophy mm-hmm. behind how to do data correctly or efficiently. Um, there's a lot more talk about the modern data stack. What what prompted you to get more involved in that conversation recently? Um, <laughs> Uh, I was bad at every other job. Uh, you know this as, as well as anyone. Uh, the job of a founder to start up is is often to to do whatever somebody else isn't currently doing. Um, and so when we first started Boat, actually, I, there were three of us. Uh, you know, at some point, four or five of us. Most of those folks were engineers. They were capable of building the product. Derek, our CEO, was out doing CEO things. Um, you're familiar with those, talking to investors, uh, being the, the smiling face of the company. Uh, I wasn't good at that one either. And so I didn't really have much to do. So I basically wrote blog posts. Um, and at and, and that point, it wasn't about, there was much less conversation about sort of like data ecosystem things. Um, but I wrote, so I wrote blog posts that were essentially scrape data from the internet, talk about stuff that is unrelated to technology at all, um, but is is data oriented. If you go to like Mode's blog, the very first blog post from like four days after the company was founded was about Miley Cyrus and the VMAs and like YouTube data that I scraped about the Miley Cyrus video that like won a bunch of awards had like the worst YouTube reviews you've ever seen. And so I was like, what's going on with this? Data people want to talk about data things. Like there's a there's a kind of attraction of the 538 style of, of thinking and, and conversation among data people. And so, you know, it kind of resonated with the people that we wanted to, to connect with. And, you know, at some point it was like the thing that you are best at is probably, you know, kind of talking about these sort of things. Um, it's also something I enjoy. Uh, I think it's interesting to be a part of these conversations. Um, there wasn't some sort of like big motive behind it. There is no sort of grand plan, to be entirely frank. It's interesting to, to be involved in these conversations. It's certainly useful for, for mode to to be able to understand what people are saying and kind of understand the direction of the industry and what you know, folks like yourself think about where things are headed. There is unfortunately no great story behind it. I feel like that's how a lot of things happen, right? They evolve sort of organically over time. There's plenty to talk about in this space. It's this interesting conjunction of it's, it's rapidly evolving. The sort of like way things get done is still in this, like a Cambrian explosion or something like that. The sort of like era that we're in around the tooling and the practices changing very quickly. Um, so there's no no shortage of interesting topics and people who've seen the evolution of the space from different you know stages of it that have a different perspective. There's also a lot of interesting things to me about just like Silicon Valley and the way that that, that whole ecosystem works. Um, and so it's even you know talking about the the unbundling of airflow is interesting uh, or whatever bundling unbundling we're currently in to me that's also kind of culturally interesting too. And, and so I don't know I enjoy being a part of those conversations. Um, all right, Ben, it's time for rapid fire mode. I have three questions for you. The first one, uh, I think this will be highly divisive. So think carefully, uh, pizza or bagels? Pizza, uh, bagels have their place, but like you can always eat pizza. I don't always want a bagel. If someone shows up pizza, I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, the, the, the heavily loaded bagel sandwich is definitely, uh, definitely Mm. a strong contender, but yeah, I think the, the universal applicability of pizza is tough to, tough to contend with. All right, Ben, question two, uh, when you are coding, I assume you still do at least once in a while. What is, what is your favorite thing to listen to? Uh, when I write in like monospaced text editors, uh, sometimes it's code, sometimes God knows what, um, Favorite thing to listen to, you know, like top 40. I don't know. I don't have any, some deep cut. This is my, you know, house music from this 2008 trip to Malta. Um, you know, Olivia Rodrigo is pretty great. I don't know what to tell you. I see she's got a new show on, on Disney Plus. I'm excited. Mm-hmm. 
uh, in Canto, I've heard is the uh, is the upcoming uh, big hitter when it comes to the the music. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno number one, uh, but the other song, the song from the sisters, better would recommend uh, Surface Pressure. It's it's the dark horse. Highly recommend. Last question. Uh, you have been in data visualization and charting and analytics for quite a while. What is the most underrated data visualization that you you think deserves more attention? Animated ones, basically. The, the New York Times has like their really fancy data viz stuff. Like it's it is it is well beyond the capacity of what anybody in the world other than the New York Times can do. Probably, truly. Um, but a lot of things they build they build where. You basically like click through them and they tell stories or you scroll through them and it sort of evolves as you see it. And they seem sort of cheesy and they're the kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily like expect in some like McKinsey deck. Um, But that like intertwining a narrative with a visualization to me is like such a powerful way to actually tell, tell stories and get people to understand what you're looking at. But it's, it's, the types of things that call out the things that you should be paying attention to rather than saying, here's some charts. I assume you know what to take from this. Um, My second answer would be uh, there there was this chart that the New York Times also did that I think was like COVID cases over time. And it was like this circular chart thing. It was like, it looked like a pinwheel. Um, And it got panned as being like, why in the world did you not just make a line chart? Uh, And like all of data, Twitter lost their mind over it. But all the data to her talked about it. And, and to me, like, there is something to be said for the 3D bar chart that everybody hates but can't look away from. That ultimately, if, like, you have the world's most beautiful visualization but nobody pays attention to it, so what? Um, and it's, it's the things that are creative. People see them as, like, unnecessary ornamentation. Uh, and I think in a lot of cases, it's like, no, that ornamentation is to get you to pay attention to it uh, and actually think about what it's telling you. And so I think there's, there's something to be said for visualizations that, that are adorned in ways that doesn't seem like they should be, but but in practice that that makes you actually look at it. It's like a, it's like the train wreck uh, of charts. You can't look away. Yeah, you know, it's uh, I've never had a chart that hundreds of thousands of people have talked about, so I can't tell them how to make them. They clearly have. Uh, so good for them. Uh, they figured out something. Jokes all on us. Uh, All right, Ben, thanks for chatting with me today. This is a lot of fun. Um, If you want to learn more about Mode uh, or subscribe to Ben's Substack, we're going to put the links down in the description below to encourage you to check both those out. Uh, Ben, thanks for being on the show and uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.